That's fine with me. All right, then let's slowly start. Welcome everyone to the November edition of the One World Mathematics of Climate seminar series. I'm really, really happy to um, have uh, Vedata Goswami here today. Um, Vedata um, has a background in, in physics, um, did his PhD at um, Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and the University of, of Potsdam and for, for a few years now leads a research group at the University of Tübingen in the Excellence Cluster on Machine Learning, um, developing methods, uh, machine learning based methods for climate science. And I'm um, really much, very much looking forward to his talk, Understanding Climate Variability with Statistical Machine Learning. So Vedanta, thank you very much. The floor is yours. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here and to have a chance to speak in this really cool series of talks, I think, uh, if it's good to be placed in this list of really cool speakers. Um, so today, I'm basically going to summarize two projects that are going on um, in, in our group by, by uh, two of our students. And in both of them, we use very, you'd say, classical machine learning techniques uh, to uh, statistical machine learning techniques to basically reveal features and insights into uh, the weather system and to atmospheric dynamics uh, by, in some way, you know, digging deep into the huge amount of weather data sets that we have right now, right? And I've structured my talk accordingly. It's basically, you know, uh, these two papers. I mean, the first one is already out this year. It's where we're going to use something called climate networks, and we are going to use climate networks to study the South Asian summer monsoon, and that's Felix's work. Uh, and, and we did it together with uh, Ruth from the UK, and Nicholas uh, is also a part of the study. And the second uh, part of the talk would be about clustering some very cluster of climate data and uh, the surface temperature data, and that's Jakob's project. And that's uh, the preprint is out and it's under review. They're not equally divided in terms of time. Uh, the first one, uh, in my experience, uh, it takes a little bit more time to explain uh, because of this whole climate networks aspect, but uh, we'll see how it goes. All right. So moving on to the first part. Uh, first part of the talk, I've, I'm going to provide you a brief outline uh, of this first part. I'm going to tell you very briefly what are climate networks and why we use them. And then I'm going to get more specific about our project and our study and uh, where we use something called event synchronization uh, networks of extreme rainfall over the South Asian monsoon region. And then we use uh, something called the stochastic block model, which is a very classical method to detect communities once you have a network, network or a graph. And we'll look at some first results. And after that, we're going to sort of uh, dig deeper into our results and, and identify what we call rainfall propagation pathways uh, using k-means clustering. Um, and then finally, we'll try to go back to the meteorology and understand what do these results mean. All right, so what are climate networks? Um, sorry about how this worked out with this visualization, but if I maybe just exit the slideshow, you can see a better visualization. Uh, climate networks essentially start by first delineating um, an observation grid over the Earth system. It does not have to be regular like what we see here in the schematic, but essentially you start by saying that you have an observation grid where you have measurements of different weather and atmospheric variables at each of these locations. So if you look at the top right and these each of these black dots would represent one location in space where you make observations in time. For example, observations of temperature, pressure, wind, and the list can go on. And once you have that, what you end up with is that you end up with a huge database of uh, spatially indexed time series that's here in the bottom right corner, right? You have this time series data. And what we want to do is we want to construct a network representation that encodes the temporal correlations within these time series data. So you, you would essentially go through, if you have uh, 1,000 locations where you have different time series, you would go through each of these 1,000 locations 
uh, you would select pairs of time series, measure the correlation, and store it. So then you would have uh, thousands times thousand correlation matrix, right? And once you have these correlation matrix, you would try to retain only, in some sense, the most meaningful or the most strongest, in some sense, or statistically meaningful correlations that are not explainable by random noise. And that leads to a very sparse network, a complex network, or, or a graph, uh, as mathematicians like to call it. And that is denoted here in this cartoon on the bottom left, where you see that we've tried to visualize the, the links between different locations in space, which essentially encode the fact that these locations in space have a very strong correlation. So what we've done is we've gone from our initial measurements and come up with a network representation that is embedding this globe. And once we've done this, we can now use this whole toolbox of, of complex network measures and graph theory to characterize our data. We can use ideas like degree, betweenness, clustering, short spots, um, communities, thing, right? I see this as a kind of uh, more involved characterization of the dynamics, uh, the spatial temporal relations that are encoded in your, in your measurements. Uh, in some sense, it is nothing else but a more sophisticated statistical measure of your data, quantification of your data. So how do climate networks then look like? You can see, for example, here, this is, uh, uh, these, these are two figures from a paper by Angit in a few years ago, where on the left, he essentially again took uh, rainfall data from the weather meteorological observation network in, in and around Germany, the black points essentially denote where he uh, took extreme weather rain, rainfall measurements from. And he used event synchronization to construct a climate network between these data sets. And that network is again visualized on the right here, where you see these gray lines, the shaded gray lines denoting this, the strongest correlation between two weather stations in terms of extreme rainfall behavior. What I would like to sort of convey in this figure here on the right is that the, the, what I would like to, for you to take home is that, you know, you see features that are, in my opinion, quite non-trivial. For example, you see that you know uh, there is this somehow group of weather stations in the very southeast of Germany that seem to have a lot of dense links connecting them together. But then there seems to be a kind of boundary between that and this other dense group of stations in the middle of in Germany. And the northeast part of Germany are somehow disconnected from, from the rest of the country which seems to sort of indicate that there are features that are encoded in the, in, in the spatial temporal correlations of your extreme rainfall measurements, which are not easily maybe observable just by looking at the mean rainfall or the variance of the rainfall, right? And this is why we, 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 we feel climate networks provides us a really interesting way of looking at different cross sections of, of, our, of the dynamics encoded in our data sets. So just to briefly summarize, I would say that we want to use climate networks because they help us to uncover non-trivial spatial patterns of, of climate. Uh, we can maybe use them to detect uh, similarities over large distances, which uh, historically are, are termed as teleconnections in, in meteorology. We can try to detect irregularly shaped clusters. We can also try to reveal higher order features of climate systems using characteristics such as degree, clustering, and betweenness. There have been many studies which have also proposed to use climate networks as a validation benchmark to, to see if uh, the dynamics that are encoded in our climate models represent spatial temporal correlations that are observed by looking at climate networks of historical data, right? And you can also use them to use se separate and group different kinds of climatologies using using uh, network properties. And again, to sort of just give you a brief flavor that these, this is not just an abstract kind of motivation argument uh, argument that I'm trying to put forward here. There is like, it's 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 a small group of people who are working uh, on this, but then it's still, it's, it's, it's growing with each passing year in my opinion. And we see more and more studies that are adopting these 
these ideas of using complex networks method to, to look at different aspects of, of meteorological and climatological problems. For example, you know, we have uh, this paper where you can come up with early warning signals of extreme floods, uh, trying to forecast the amount of Indian monsoon rainfall. You can use them to study teleconnection patterns uh, over the globe. You can use basically climate networks as a statistical tool to, to address different um, research problems in meteorology and, and climate. In our study, uh, what we want to uh, address is we want to ask the question, can we use climate networks to characterize the interseasonal variability of the Asian summer monsoon? And we do this using event synchronization, and I'll come to, I'll come to that in a minute. So we construct what are called event synchronization networks over uh, of extreme rainfall in the SASM. And we will use network communities uh, to characterize the data further. What do I mean by event synchronization? So we the first step in this uh, is that we, we take measurement data, again, in this small schematic, the black dots in this South Asian summer monsoon domain, they represent location where we have uh, rainfall measurements. And we see here two such locations, the data from two such locations, the green time series and the magenta time series. So we take this rainfall time series and we threshold this to retain only the timestamps where we have observed extreme rainfall. And the threshold is a percentile based threshold, threshold which uh, in this uh, schematic is the 90th percentile. So anything above the 90th percentile is recorded as an extreme event. So that gets a one and anything below the 90th percentile gets a zero. So we effectively binarize our rainfall time series to get what we call the event time series shown here in the third panel, where you es essentially have entries of zeros and ones, where ones represent the occurrence of an extreme rainfall on that day. Uh, this is daily data. And zeros represent a um, day without any extreme rainfall. And we want to now study when did two locations in space have uh, extreme rainfall events within a small time period of each other. So in some sense, we want to study when were two pairs of locations in space, uh, when, when did different locations in space have synchronized extreme events, extreme rainfall. And we do this uh, by, in some sense, a very fancy version of counting, counting uh, coinciding events, uh, and that's called event synchronization. Essentially what you do is you can take a small time window, this red rectangle, and you can move it along pairs of time series and count the number of times where you observe extreme events occurring simultaneously within the window in these two pairs of time series. And this gives you something called a synchronization count, and you use the synchronization count to place an edge of your climate network between two locations whenever the synchronization count is uh, statistically significant as opposed uh, with reference to a randomized null model that I'm not going to go into the details here, but if you're curious about it, you can talk about it. In placing an edge between pairs of locations, what you effectively, you can effectively represent that as an adjacency matrix of your complex network where each black dot here in this matrix represents an edge between pairs of locations. So if you have n locations, your adjacency matrix is n times n. And all this, all the black dots essentially represent a one, uh, which means that pairs, this, this pair of location, i and j, a i j equals one means that it has an extreme uh, event synchronization count and has an edge between those pairs of locations. So we effectively now constructed our network. What do we do then? In our in our study, we want to use uh, communities of the network to uh, quantify regions that showed synchronization of extreme rainfall in coherence as opposed to other regions where they were sort of a bit out of phase, you can see, right? And to detect communities in the network, we use a very well-established uh, model called the stochastic block model that essentially boils down to writing down the adjacency matrix as a block diagonal matrix with sparse entries in the off-diagonal regions 
and then doing a Bayesian estimation procedure to determine which block diagonal matrix would be the closest to what we observe, uh, closest to the adjacency matrix that we observe in our, in, in our uh, from our event synchronization data. And the stochastic log model, uh, as the name says, it's, in, it's inherently probabilistic. So we do multiple runs of this model and we get slightly different results across the multiple runs, but overall the, the, the results uh, are, are stable maybe with slightly different um, probabilities uh, at the edges of each community. And what you can do is once you've identified the communities in your adjacency matrix, you can go back, you can map these communities back to the spatial locations to where each of these communities belong to. And that would result in a map like this on the left, right? So the, and again, this is this is schematic, but then for example, the, the orange block could represent maybe a community here in the West Pacific, uh, the very lowermost dark blue block can maybe here represent a spatial community here in over uh, Southeast Asia uh, and Indonesia. Um, and in this way, you can use your extreme event synchronization network, detect communities within it, and map the communities back into the spatial domain to essentially identify regions where extreme rainfall events are synchronized on a large spatial scale, coherent within the region, but this coherence sort of is, is a little bit out of phase to other regions which are again cohere coherent within themselves, right? That, that would be the sort of meteorological intuition behind what these communities mean. What do we do once we've identified these communities? Uh, we'll get to that in a moment, but uh, what we do is that we can now uh, use a membership likelihood across the multiple runs, which encodes the probability that a given spatial locations belongs to one particular community. So the membership likelihood here on the on the left panel essentially is the likelihood of any given location in space to belong to the community that we see here in very light beach here, right? We can index the different community and identify these posterior probabilities. You, uh, you can think of them. Uh, and this is just one instance of that. And once you have uh, this membership likelihood, you can create a more, and, and you can think of this membership likelihood as a kind of an aggregation across the multiple runs of the stochastic block model, right? It, it collapses the different runs of the stochastic block model into a single, single result. You can set a threshold and make a hard boundary of your community. And using that hard boundary, you can define something called a synchronous rainfall index within that community, which essentially counts the number of synchronous extreme rainfall events within the community. And this is, again, a daily time series that goes over time. And we use the synchronous rainfall index at a later stage in the analysis. To summarize the method briefly again, uh, because there were many different steps involved, we start with rainfall time series in our spatial domain, uh, that's in the top left. Uh, we take rainfall time series, and, and then we threshold them according to some pre-chosen percentile threshold and binarize the time series to get um, zeros and ones over time. We count the number of synchronous, synchronous events within a tolerance window of, uh, in this case, 10 days for every pair of time series and get the synchronization count check if this synchronization count is significant with respect to a random null model and construct the HSNC matrix if the synchronization count is significant, essentially placing an edge between the pair of time series if it is significant. And that gives us the HSNC matrix. And then we use the stochastic block model to detect communities in the HSNC matrix, go back to the spatial domain and see how these communities look over, over the spatial domain. And use, aggregate the information over the multiple runs of the stochastic block model to get the membership likelihood of every location in space to belong to all, all the different communities. And that membership likelihood allows us to sort of draw a hard boundary, we can threshold it at, at 0.9 and draw a hard boundary over uh, to, to get our final communities, so to speak. That is an aggregate result of all the different runs of the stochastic block model. And in the end, once we have the hard boundaries of every community, we can construct the synchronous rainfall index for each community. 
that's basically a, a, a summary of the entire analysis pipeline, so to speak. Now, let's look at some first results. For the beginning, let's just focus on the left panel here. That shows us these six communities that we identified at the end of the, the ensemble of, at, at the end of aggregating the results from the ensemble of stochastic block model runs and setting a hard boundary of the membership likelihood at 0.9, we get this, these very six spatially well-defined communities. And when we got this, it was actually quite comforting to, to see that you know, some of these shapes do, do make sense from a meteorological perspective. For example, even this boomerang shape that is named here as the Bay of Bengal community, uh, this shape has also been reported in meteorological studies and climate modeling studies of uh, interseasonal variability over the Asian monsoon domain. So, uh, as 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 well as this South Asia community, which is this tilted community that goes all the way from Pakistan to the Central Pacific, like a cutting transect across Southeast Asia, this has also been seen and and well uh, well known reported phenomenon in, in different meteorological studies. So it's good to know that you know whatever we detect at the end of this sophisticated, really involved data analysis pipeline, it's not a kind of a artifact, but corresponds to ideas that are established in the meteorological literature. What we now did was also looked at the spatial propagation uh, of extreme rainfall across these communities. So you can sort of do that in, in, in the way that you can count the number of events that take place, for example, in the equatorial Indian Ocean community in the bottom left, and then uh, take that as day zero, or all those days when you observe really high number of extreme events in, in the Indian Ocean community, take that as day zero, and then count how many extreme events occurred in all the communities starting from day zero to 30 days later. And then you, you can plot those uh, counts in, in uh, a color-coded matrix, as we see here on the right, where we've arranged the different communities on the horizontal axis. So you can think of the horizontal axis as encoding space in some sense. Uh, you go from the East uh, Equatorial Indian Ocean community to the Bay of Bengal, then Maritime Continent, South Asia, and West Pacific. And the vertical axis is time, right? And you see that there is a clear propagation of large number of extreme events occurring first in the Indian Ocean and then moving to the Bay of Bengal community and then maritime continent, South Asia, and finally to the West Pacific. In some sense, it means that extreme events tend to start here in the equatorial Indian Ocean and then move in a northeasterly direction towards the West Pacific. And this is again an established uh, known fact in, in, in the meteorological literature. And this is something called the intraseasonal oscillation. Uh, people, uh, there are people who also call it the boreal summer intraseasonal oscillation, uh, the monsoon intraseasonal oscillation. And it's it's known that the, this intraseasonal oscillation tends to start in the Indian Ocean and then moves in a northeasterly fashion going over the entire South Asian monsoon domain and ends ending in the Western Pacific. This was also really good to, good to see that we could arrive at results that corroborate uh, existing consensus in the meteorological literature. Right, so now once, once we had this, we wanted to dig a little deeper into this results. And essentially what we wanted to see is if all of the times when events propagate from the Indian Ocean to the Western Pacific, if they all follow the same pathway in some sense, if they all show the same pattern. And we address this question by using k-means clustering. How do we do this? We do this again in, 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 in a similar way that we look at the synchronous rainfall index for the EIO community, the Indian Ocean community, and identify the days of maximum synchronization. And that gives us 126 cases over our entire data, data, data span. We set these as day zero, and then we look at average OLR conditions in the days following day zero, right? Uh, as we as we saw in the previous plot here, a little bit. Now we create 
latitude time and longitude time plots of OLR in this way, right? And they look a little bit like this. Uh, here again on, on the horizontal axis is space in some sense. Uh, on the left plot, you have latitude on the horizontal axis and on the right, uh, longitude on the horizontal axis. And on the right, you have latitude in the horizontal axis. And on the fertile axis in both plots, you have time. And if you now take the average uh, plot of OLR over all of these 126 samples, of which are the days of maximum synchronization in the Indian Ocean community, you see this behavior, which encodes this classical northeasterly propagation of extreme rainfall, right? Because on the left, you have something that starts in the very east in the Indian Ocean, and it shows the eastward propagation. The vertical lines denote a maritime continent region. Um, and on the right plot, you see things that are starting around the equator and maybe even a little bit, bit below the equator and going northwards. And taken together, you have northward propagation, propagation and eastward propagation. And this is the classical uh, propagation of the intraseasonal oscillation from the Indian Ocean to the Western Pacific. Now, what we do essentially is we take each of the individual 126 pairs of plots that we have here, we un unwind them and into one long vector, into two vectors essentially, one vector for the latitude time plot and one vector for the longitude time plot. And we have 126 such pairs of vectors. And we cluster this, these, these, these data using k-means clustering. And the results look somewhat like this. We get three distinct clusters as um, can be verified by using well-established uh, criteria like the silhouette coefficient. Uh, we get three distinct clusters and we are showing them here on the right. So from on the top row, what you see is the results of one cluster which has 49 samples and we call it the canonical cluster. In the canonical cluster, you see essentially the same eastward and northward propagation as you also observed in the aggregate um, uh, average over all 126 cases. Uh, and this corresponds to the what we call now the canonical propagation of extreme rainfall from, from uh, Pacific Indian Ocean to the Pacific. In the middle row, we have the eastward block cluster, which has 28 samples. And we call it eastward block because it begins to move eastward from the Indian Ocean, but then after hitting the maritime continent, it does not move forward. However, the northward propagation, although it's not exactly the same as the canonical, uh, the northward propagation is still there in some sense. And finally, the, in, the, in the last cluster, uh, we observe what we call quasi-stationary behavior in the sense that we do have extreme rainfall starting in the Indian Ocean, but there is not much propagation going on. And essentially, it, it remains within the Indian Ocean in some sense. So we do then identify three distinct spatiotemporal propagation patterns that correspond to these three distinct clusters that come out at the end of this play means cluster, right? And then the question is, what are the conditions that give rise to these different types? And this is the point where we want to go back to the meteorology and want to interpret our results uh, from and, and try to see if we can come up with some meteorological explanation or some process-based explanation of why this happened. And we, the first thing that we try to do is we want to identify the background climatic explanations. And to do this, uh, we again go back to the day zero timings of all the three cases, of all the three clusters. And we look at average conditions for different meteorological variables into the 25 to 30 days preceding day zero to sort of see what could have been the background atmospheric or oceanic conditions that give rise to this difference, uh, difference in propagation. And the most uh, explanatory variable that we found was sea surface temperature. And that's shown here in, on the right. On the top, you see the sea surface temperature background corresponding to the canonical case. And in the middle, you see the sea surface temperature corresponding to the eastward block case. And the bottom, the sea surface temperature background corresponding to the quasi-stationary case. And when you show these plots to a uh, climatologist or a meteorologist, they clearly would identify this as being corresponding to what are called normal conditions, La Nina-like conditions, and El Nino-like conditions. And this was pretty cool because um, although this does not correspond to a uh, precise El Nino or La Nina, but it's conditions that are very similar to these, to these states. And this is 
it's, it's well known that the El Nino Southern Oscillation, of which these are different cases in the tropical Pacific, is coupled to how the South Asian monsoon behaves. And what we were able to show is how these conditions can essentially influence the spatial propagation within a particular season, the well, spatial propagation of extreme rainfall over the monsoon time, right? And that brings me to a, the summary of part, part one. Uh, we used event synchronization to construct climate networks on extreme rainfall in the South Asian monsoon region. We used climate network communities uh, to identify different regions of, of, of coherence of ex synchronized extreme events and showed that extreme events show a propagation pattern from the Indian Ocean to the Western Pacific. And then we clustered uh, space-time plots of OLR using k-means clustering and identified three distinct propagation patterns, uh, which correspond to different background sea surface temperature conditions in the Pacific. And this, this last part, this correspondence between uh, different propagation patterns to the SST background, this is our new contribution. This is something that was, to best of our knowledge, not, uh, not known in the literature. Right, that brings me to the uh, end of the first part and to the second part of the talk where I'm going to briefly talk about how we used uh, clustering techniques for the El Nino Southern Oscillation and came up with something new. So this part of the talk is organized in this way. I will briefly, in three to five minutes, talk about what, why do we care about the El Nino Southern Oscillation and what do we mean by Enzo diversity because that is what this, this project is about. And I'm going to explain our approach to Enzo diversity, where we first construct a low dimensional representation of sea surface temperature data, and then use Gaussian mixture modeling and identify different process. And in the end, again, we want to go back to the meteorology and interpret the results with, with, within its correct uh, climatological and meteorological context. Right, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, just so that all of us are on the same page, the El Nino Southern Oscillation essentially is um, an alternating behavior of sea surface temperatures in the tropical Pacific, where you, from time to time, you have uh, abnormally warm temperatures, which is known as the El Nino phase, uh, and then it swings, swings to abnormally cold temperatures, which is known as the La Nina phase, here on the right. And this happens with, uh, in, a, in a very complicated, uh, with complicated periodicities, and it uh, is somehow different people have different opinions on it. Like some people call it quasi periodic, some people call it irregular. But in any case, you do have this alternating uh, phases of between abnormally warm and abnormally cold, cold uh, temperatures in the tropical Pacific. And we capture this most often using this one scalar time series, uh, which is an average of sea surface temperature deviations over the tropical Pacific and over a box in the tropical Pacific. And this is called the El Nino uh, 3.4 index, where extreme positive deviations in this index correspond to abnormally warm conditions, correspond to this, this plot on the left in some sense. And extreme negative deviations in this index correspond to uh, situations which look like this plot, a, a little bit like this plot on the right, the La Nina phases. Right, and we care about the El Nino Southern Oscillation because the uh, uh, they, the two phases El Nino and La Nina they are known to have consequences, impacts of, and they are they're known to lead to or or precede extreme weather conditions in different parts around the globe. So, for example, this is what is called a teleconnection map from uh, a well-established schematic that is, is quite popular, where you see that if you have an El Nino, you have uh, drier conditions, for example, over India, West Africa, South Africa, uh, Australia, and so on. And you have extreme wet conditions over uh, California, Mexico, um, Southeast, uh, Eastern Asia, and, and so Right, and somewhat the opposite happens, not exactly, but somewhat the opposite happens when you have a La Nina uh, uh, event, a La Nina phase of the Enzo, where you again have wet conditions uh, over India, South Africa, and West Africa, and you have dry conditions over California and Southern United States. And 
because the Enzo leads to uh, different weather patterns, extreme weather patterns around the globe, it is uh, a topic of intensive study, right? And this is why we uh, concern ourselves with the Enzo. And uh, it's also what I want to show here in this slide is that it, it's also that the, the 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 problem is not solved, so to speak, right? Like it's it's we, people are still actively trying to understand how do different uh, aspects of the Enzo lead to different extreme uh, extreme weather events around the globe. For example, here we have a couple of studies which still try to understand how the Enzo leads to extreme rainfall over India. By Enzo diversity, what, what we mean is that um, even though you can sort of group uh, the Enzo phases into El Nino, the warm phase, and the La Nina, the cold phases, there's this, uh, I think quite a popular quote that says like no two El Ninos are alike, right? So different El Nino and La Nina events essentially show different characteristics. So, and classically both El Nino and La Nina are subdivided into two types based on where you observe the warming and the cold uh, uh, and the cooling in the Pacific. Uh, one is called the Eastern Pacific type and the other is called the Central Pacific type. And these different types of El Ninos and La Ninas are reported again to have different kinds of downstream impacts, right? And they look a little bit like this plot here on the right, where on the top panel, you see a very classical East Pacific, Eastern Pacific El Nino, or called the EP El Nino. In the second plot from the top, you see a classical representation of a Central Pacific El Nino, a CP El Nino, and then you have an EP La Nina and a CP La Nina, right? So these will be then the four classes or the four categories that uh, are typically thought of when you talk about Enzo diversity um, and different kinds of El Ninos and La Ninas with different downstream impacts. And what we asked ourselves in this uh, project is that we asked the question, can we recover these categories from a purely data-driven perspective? And for that, we use a low-dimensional representation and Gaussian emission models. How does this work? So here I show us simple schematic of how uh, we want to go about it. Essentially, we, we take our input data, that is, which is sea surface temperature fields, uh, sea surface temperature Im images, so to speak, over the tropical Pacific between 30 North and 30 South. And we have uh, a whole sequence of such images. We encode this data into uh, a low dimensional space and uh, such that we also have good reconstructions. And uh, in the low dimension space, we want to now cluster our data. And you can essentially think of this now. Okay, we have the data X that goes through this encoding function E of X and gives you the low dimension latent space, uh, the low dimension representation Z. And the decoding function tries to reproduce something which is very similar to the, encode, uh, the input data uh, X hat. And this function can be whatever you want. I mean, we, we tried it with uh, principal component analysis, which in, uh, is also known as empirical orthogonal functions. Uh, but we've also tried with other variants, uh, nonlinear neural network-based uh, encodings, such as um, autoencoders, variation autoencoders, and so on. And the results seem to be fairly robust. And the clustering we want to do uh, using caution mixture models, because this allows you to sort of get a fuzzy number in the sense that it does not provide you a hard clustering boundary, but it rather provides you the probability of a data point to belong to the cluster. And essentially, Gaussian mixture model tries to model uh, the data in this latent space, Z, as arising from uh, a set of different uh, Gaussians distributed, uh, uh, spread or spread in different parts of, of the latent space set, and where each of these different um, Gaussians can have a different maybe uh, probability of selection, which is given by P of C K. So C K is the different Gaussians, uh, the ca different ca categories C K, and once you select a particular Gaussian, then P Z of C K, Z given C K, and calls the probability that a data point belongs to that particular Gaussians and your overall probability of observing a data point is the summation of all these, the probabilities that you obtain from each of the individual Gaussians. In this approach, we still have to determine, however, the number of Gaussians that we choose uh, in the end. And we do this using the Bayesian information criteria. Uh, 
And we find that, for example, on the left, you see uh, the Bayesian information criteria being plotted for choosing the latent space dimension as two, the size of the latent space dimension as two. So you just have two E1s and you see a clear minima at five. I'm sorry. And when we uh, just check for since, uh, robustness and sensit sensitivity, when we even change the number of EOFs to, to three, four, and so on, uh, we find that the minima more or less always, apart from four, more or less always tends to be or at five. So it seems like a fairly robust result that uh, five categories explain, the uh, five uh, cautions explain the distribution of, of uh, encoded SSD images uh, the best in according to the Bayesian information criteria. And these are how these five uh, categories look like uh, for the case that we choose the latest space to be two dimensional, so only two EOFs. Uh, you have here what we call an extreme El Nino category that encodes these, these data points, uh, uh, which are, are very far away from the uh, neutral state. And then you have uh, what's something very similar to the classical EP El Nino, uh, classical CP El Nino, P Lania, and Lania, and CP Lania. And we also, one thing about this analysis is that we try to include as many different reanalysis data sets as possible. So in, in total, we actually have eight reanalysis data sets that go into this entire analysis, and then we get these results. But the results are fairly robust also if you choose a different subset of reanalysis data sets. All right, so how does this classification of um, the SSD, SSD fields uh, into five categories correspond to the existing classification, right? And this is how we sort of interpret it, that now if we go from the bottom to the top, so CP Laninias in the classical classification, in the canonical classification and R classification look very similar. So does EP Laninias look quite similar. CP Laninios also look quite a bit similar. It's just that the EP El Nino category in, in the existing classification seems to have been split up, so to speak, into two different subcategories. Here, what we call something the canonical EP El Nino and the extreme El Nino. Right, we have this, but then we also now want to sort of see what does sort of, diff what makes the extreme El Nino a bit different from the EP El Nino? Why does it come about as a different uh, cluster. Can we have some other, uh, again, process-based explanation of why this should be grouped into two different clusters, right? Besides the increase in density and magnitude. And this is where we want to go back to the meteorology again and, and interpret the results uh, in its correct context. And we, for this, we use once more space-time plots of anomalies of essentially four variables, sea surface temperature, sea surface height. Uh, this, these, are, these two variables are well-established uh, variables that characterize uh, El Ninos and La Ninos. And also we will look at high frequency and low frequency event separately. And because there have been a few studies in the last four or five years that have shown uh, the, uh, the influence of uh, wind, different wind components in, on the development of El Ninos. And we look at a time period of over two years from the previous January to the December of the following year. Uh, when we observe an El Nino, we look from the from 12 months before the El Nino peaks to 12 months after. And this is how the results look like for sea surface temperature anomalies and sea surface height anomalies. Uh, on the left column is extreme El Nino and the right column is DPP El Nino. And here, what, what you see is that uh, the isotherm, which quantifies the warm pool edge uh, between, uh, so essentially the, the Western Pacific tends to be, uh, not in anomaly terms, but in absolute temperature terms, the Western Pacific tends to be warmer than, than the Eastern Pacific. And you can draw an isotherm at, at 29 degrees Celsius to sort of have an idea where does this change. And this is drastically different between these two categories. Also how they evolve, uh, this, this, how this isotherm evolves from the January preceding to the peak of the Nino is quite different. Uh, However, the main difference that we observe are in the wind components. What we find is that high frequency wind anomalies here in the top row play a very crucial role in the development of an extreme animal, but not in the case of an EP animal. 
whereas low frequency components uh, play seem to play a role in the development of both. Uh, and this is somehow, we do not have a, a clear explanation of why this is the case, but at least this is an indication of why there can be even a process-based reasoning or a motivation to classify the extreme alignment and the EP alignment in into two separate categories because they seem to correspond to two very distinct, different behaviors in, of high frequency wind occurring in the tropical Pacific, right? And then we contend that this makes sense to sort of treat them separately. Right, and that's the summary for part two. Uh, we used principal components or empirical orthogonal functions to project SST data uh, from the tropical Pacific into a two-dimensional space. And in this uh, lower dimensional representation, we use the Gaussian mixture model to cluster the data uh, in a fuzzy manner. And we determine the optimal number of clusters using the Bayesian information criterion, and it seemed to be fairly robust, even if you choose the dimensionality of the low dimensional space to be different. And our results sort of tend to retrieve three of the existing categories of Enzo diversity, but the fourth category, the canonical EP Alenio, seems to be split up into our classification into two different types, a weak uh, EP Alenio and an extreme Alenio. And when we go back to uh, the, the different meteorological variables that are related to the development of uh, the uh, different Alenios, we find that the extreme El Nino has a different onset and evolution, especially in terms of high frequency wind when compared to the EP El Nino, suggesting that this is not just a statistical result, but it makes also meteorological sense to put them into different categories. Right, um, that's just about it. Uh, uh, I want to sort of briefly uh, mention a few final takeaways that statistical machine learning uh, methods can help reveal new insights into thematic and meteorological phenomenon. However, machine learning is never enough. In my opinion, we need to always go back to the uh, rightful meteorological and meteorological context and interpret our statistical results properly. And I feel these uh, SML methods provide powerful descriptive tools that can help explore large climate databases. And right? uh, that's about it. Uh, of course, this is a work of these three guys. Um, and if you are interested, I want to talk about it. And in more details, just feel free to reach out. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Vedata. Um, that was very interesting. Um... Uh, I have a f maybe a few, qu but maybe maybe I open the the floor first for questions from the audience. So either you can just um, um, unmute yourself and ask a question, or put the question to the chat, of course, as you prefer. But then maybe if people need a bit more time to think about their questions, maybe I can ask you one question where I'm not quite sure if I can formulate it properly. Um, so whenever we do these like correlation or synchronization based um, network construction, where we first have a full coupling matrix where there's sort of all pairwise comparisons are stored in that matrix um, with climate data or with any other data, in principle, there's a risk or let's say there's a possibility that we run into multiple comparison issues. And if we have spatially correlated um, uh, fields that, for which we are doing this, then we would even have maybe large chunks of 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 the of the of of, of grid cells of the of the on the surface that would be coupled to other large chunks and that could still arise due to sort of spuriously due to multiple comparisons. Um, and my, so somehow this, this in, in, in my head, I connect this re relatively strongly with the whole um, very nice community detection and clustering approaches that you showed here. And the question is, do you think there could be a way to address this um, possible issue of multiple comparisons and, and spurious connections via the community detection? Sort of, could you on the on the level of where you look at the communities, could one think of a significance test that could take care of the 
um, of the of the of the multiple comparison issue. Um, at the level of communities, um, are are we still so? If we are at the level of communities, are we still talking about multiple comparison? The 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 risk of having false edges in the original adjacency matrix is that the question? So we we try to do something at the community level, but we want to correct edges at the at the at the micro level. Precisely. Uh, this is I I haven't thought about this. Maybe something might be possible. I I always thought that we probably need to get away from from. Uh, the constructing edges at the micro level. So right now, for example, what 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 I I really am am actively working on and and I want to go ahead with is and there are some ideas already in this in this direction also for climate is that you maybe it's a better way to construct a, a network is to sort of start at some point in space, expand in in geographically in space and keep keep sort of storing your your local correlations and uh, that way you also don't enter into this whole uh or ill estimation of the correlation matrix kind of situation where n is greater than p kind of situation right and and at some point correlations decay in space right and then you stop there and then you sort of you know do that all it's like a ink filling thing that you can do on your whole, whole space and then and then maybe use that as a starting point to sort of construct a more more principled network where by definition you will have less number of edges but then you always can sort of downscale whatever you whatever you learn at a coarser scale you can probably also downscale um, back to the fine scale uh, at the micro level maybe this is a little bit in spirit similar to what you suggested but to use some to use the community themselves uh, to go back to the micro level, I have to think about it, but it's it's an interesting idea. Right, cool. Thank you. Any further questions? Also, of course, just pure questions of understanding are most welcome. Maybe then I, I'll ask another question. Um, in what you have um, presented in, in, ah, no, here's a question, very good, um, by Alessandro Lobo. Do, you, do the communities depend a lot on the window width used for synchronization? Yeah, um, for, for small changes, no. Uh, so we use a window of 10 days. If you were to change that to uh, uh, 15 days or, or seven, six days, I don't think the communities would change a lot because you would still be sort of capturing synchronizations that are happening on this weather time scales, right? Like, like the, the, your tolerance window would still be on the scale of weather, uh, which is typically a one day to up to two weeks. But now if you were to change your window, let's say up to 30 days, and then you sort of get into more seasonal kind of synchronization patterns. And then I think you probably, I haven't looked at it, but my intuition would be that then you might get slightly different synchronizations. All right, so if there's any follow-up questions, then yeah, okay. So that Alison writes, thanks, very nice. <laughs> Um, then by Vijan Fala, in the second part, when you cluster the SST data into five, do you think we would have more if we have higher resolution data? Um, in the future. Yeah, I am not entirely um, sure if uh, you mean higher resolution in time or space. Uh, in my opinion, higher resolution in space will not change the results differently because we are essentially, if you look at this latent space, every point in this latent space is corresponds to one time snapshot of your SST data. So 
our clustering here uh, groups different time periods together. Not different time periods, but different time stamps together. Uh, like, you know, it takes the, the El Nino of 98 and puts it together to the El Nino of 82, 83, right? Uh, so having a high resolution data in space probably would not make so much difference. But now if you say that, because this analysis is done on monthly data, now if you say that what happens if we use daily data? Uh, we did use daily data, the results do not change much, but I can imagine if you sort of keep changing the resolution and go from daily to hourly, then maybe you start grouping together not uh, these macro scale interannual variability, but maybe you start seeing groups of uh, dynamics, uh, categories of dynamics, which make more sense on a sub seasonal or seasonal level, then maybe the results might change uh, if you go to really high temporal resolutions. All right, then again, a question from Alessandro. When do when you do the clustering using data from different reanalysis data sets, do you treat all the data points as independent or is there special care needed for the inter data set correlations? Um, no, we we uh, we treat the different data sets as independent. Um, we, we, we somehow imagine conceptualize them as different like measuring the same reality with different thermometers in some sense like you know different thermometers from different companies so with so they are correlated in the sense that they try to measure the same things so of course i mean if you're trying to measure the same reality then if reality goes warm become warm the different thermometers will tend to go warm together and tend to go cold together but the exact magnitudes are a little bit different which is also what we see here in our plus uh, that it leads to a slightly more spread out uh, 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 variability or in distribution. What we do take care of, however, is that um, the different data data sets have different spans of time periods. So if we want to, let's say, go from 1940 to 2020, it could be that from 1940 to 1970, there were only three reanalysis data sets. And from 19, 1980 onwards, there were, let's say, five or six reanalysis data sets or eight reanalysis data sets, right? We want to keep this number constant. So we would, in regions, we, we would choose the minimum number of reanalysis that is spanning our study time period. And in time periods where there is a larger number of reanalysis data set, we would subsample that. We would take only maybe four out of eight. So that, because if you don't do that, we would get more points in certain regions, in certain time points, certain, certain time periods would be represent more just by the fact that there were more reanalysis data set and that would lead to a higher density and because gmms is all about estimating the density properly that would lead to a bias this is something that we correct for but we do not to get back to your question we do not uh, assume that the analysis reanalysis data set are correlated in and of themselves um, in, in the sense that we assume all of them are correlated in, in some very standard fashion we don't think that let's say uh, Hadley is correlated to soda more than era five. These, this nuance is not there. All right. Next question. What are the limitations or challenges you encountered while using the machine learning method for climate data? Why you use um, GMM? Are there other models that can be used? Um, okay, so in, in statistical machine learning, I think the, 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 the challenge is, is quite clear. It's, it's always, um, where, where, where is it now? Ah, yeah. The challenge is always in this step, in, the, in this whole going back to the meteorology step. I mean, to do the statistical analysis is probably not that complicated in my opinion for somebody who, who, who understands how these methods work. But once you have your results, right, and you want to sort of go back to the meteorology and under, and and understand your results in its proper meteorological context and come up with actual feasible explanations of what you see, that is really challenging. We use GMM, uh, uh, to come to your second question, we use GMM because it's a fuzzy cluster. It's a kind of fuzzy cluster. We wanted to avoid hard clustering in this uh, ENSO, ENSO project. You could, of course, use any, any clustering method you want and probably end up uh, more or less the same. 
Aha, and there's a comment by Tilly Woods that I absolutely second. Not a question, but I just wanted to thank Bobita, thank Bidata for such a clear, well-explained and interesting talk. This is not at all in my field of research, but I could follow through out and learn a lot. Thank you for making it so accessible. I absolutely agree with that. This was um, a fantastic talk, and um, it's sort of in my um, in my realm of expertise. Um, so I'm not as um, well positioned as as Tilly to comment from uh, on this. But um, yeah, thanks so much for this talk. So if there is no further questions or further I think comments, there is one question by Ivan B. Uh, it's just about the question from Scale. Ah, sorry, I, I missed that one then. Ah, yes, by Kai Wen. In the first part, whether the number of communities can be identified by indicators such as the modularity. Yeah, um, you could try to do that, but I would advise uh, not to do that. Uh, modularity and such other indicators have been shown to have a lot of limitations. Uh, there's a really nice uh, overview. It's, it's 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 several years old now, uh, by uh, Santo Fortunato on 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 detecting communities uh, that I would refer. Uh, where the, so the stochastic block model we don't really need to, uh, the, especially the particular implementation that we use. Uh, it's by Tiago Pesoto. Uh, it's quite nice that you can actually create, you do the stochastic block model in a hierarchical fashion. And at every level of the hierarchy, at every level of the choice of K, the number of uh, communities that you want, uh, it's they use a very well-defined uh, information theoretic notion of what determines the optimal partition that gives you K communities. And then it's, again, as I said, Bayesian, Bayesian uh, estimation. In, in overall, approaching community detection as a Bayesian estimation problem is, I would say, state of the art and is a more principled way of approaching community detection. Modularity seems very elegant and it's very beautiful. I've, I've, I've used it. Uh, it. It feels very beautiful. I've also used it myself in the past, but it's just that at the end of the day, it has a lot of drawbacks. It cannot, for example, identify very small communities and very large communities in the same run. This is something that modularity just cannot do. I would therefore be skeptical of using it today, especially since uh, better methods exist already. Great, thank you. And then there was also another question by Bijan Fala. Does going from linear EOF clustering to some non-linear one like isometric mapping, isomap, change the results? Um, we did not do isomap, but we, as I said, we we did use um, uh, autoencoders and variation autoencoders. Um, if you look up our our preprint, you'll, you'll find this figure, a uh, similar figure in the in the appendix. Um, what happens is that you do get the same results in terms of clustering, but this distribution of points when you use an autoencoder is not arranged in this parabolic fashion anymore. Because the encoder itself is nonlinear, it manages to take into account this nonlinearity in some sense. And you end up with this all these uh, different El Nino to La Nina points being arranged on a straight line in some sense. And then the different clusters are just picking up different uh, densities of points on this straight line. In some sense, if you use an autoencoder, you could probably just get away by doing Gaussian by projecting the data into onto a, a one-dimensional space and just doing a 1D GMM. But what we found is that the results do not change. The, the, the fact that we get five clusters, one of them corresponding to the extreme and know, this does not change. Perfect. Great. All right. Then I think now I didn't miss any other of the questions. Um as you see, there's an, a more more um very yeah comments on the chat. Um, thank you very much, Pidata. This was um very interesting, and um so with that, I would like to close uh, today's um seminar and um just already announce um the, the next um, iteration will be on December five. Um, you will see the announcement as usual. Um, the talk will be given by Martin Riptal from the University of, of Tromsø. Um, and very much looking forward to seeing many of you then next month.
Thanks again, Vidata. Thanks everyone for, for coming and have a lovely rest of your day. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.